This week on Talking Real, we bring in special guest Josh Cockroft to give you the first legislative update on Talking Real about what's going on down at 23rd and Lincoln and the Oklahoma legislature. All the important information on what's happening with Josh right now. Welcome back to Talking Real, brought to you by the Oklahoma Association of Realtors. This is episode 157 of Talking Real, and we are all over the place. Uh, Nabil, how are you today? I'm doing all right. I'm doing all right. I'm just trying, trying to stay warm. It's a frozen tundra out there, and we are joined this week by Josh Cockroft. Josh, how are you today? I'm good, guys. Thanks for having me on again. It's always, we know when Josh is back, it's that time of year that legislative session. <laughs> it's, the time that, it's that time of year. Yeah. Uh, Josh, he's staying warm and unfrozen mostly. Uh, for the most part, so far, haven't had too bad of frozen pipes, been able to unfreeze a couple of them. And so far, haven't had a rolling blackout cross our fingers. So, yeah, yeah we're surviving. Yeah, I hope everyone out there is doing all right. Um, obviously, it is a kind of a wild time right now. Um, hard to get around and frozen pipes and rolling blackouts. It just it's it's insane out there. So I hope everybody is making it okay and staying strong out there. So stay warm. I don't know what I'll say. I've got no advice for you. This is completely <laughs> this is out of my wheelhouse. So good luck. I don't know. <laughs> Uh, yeah, so we wanted to talk this week, give you a legislative update. We haven't had a chance to do that yet. Now we are a few weeks into legislative session that started at the beginning of February. So we wanted to bring Josh in because he is up to speed on all the craziness that's going on down at the Capitol. If there's much craziness at all, I don't even know. I don't know what's going on down there. So we're going to have Josh tell us. So Josh, give us a little rundown of like how just sort of from a broad standpoint, how has this first couple few weeks gone down at the session well first of all it's nice to have a little bit of a sense of normalcy at the capitol and by normalcy i do mean that craziness that you referenced (laughs) um i mean just with last year being the way that it was legislative session being out for two months once it had started and then they came back and only you know 10 members at a time trying to navigate different votes. There were a lot of bills that just went to the wayside, um, you know, from a from a lobbyist perspective, from a government affairs perspective, we kind of had to, and not just us, every organization kind of had to just scrap 2020 um, from a legislative standpoint. So it's nice to be back in the routine of things. Like you mentioned, we're in week three now of the legislative session. Things are moving ar- along very rapidly. Um, uh, you know, with three weeks uh, into committee work now, um, it's it, it's moving along at, at a normal pace. Um, like you mentioned, February 1st was the beginning of session this year, started with Governor Stitt's State of the State address, outlining his vision for this legislative session, outlining his budget, what he uh, prioritized with the executive budget. And now it's just it just begins the long process of the next four months trying to negotiate what exactly that budget looks like between the House and the Senate and the executive branch and then all the policy things that come with it. Um, When you're talking policy, uh, there's a lot of the same things that we saw last year. Um, We had more bills filed this year for the first session of a two year legislature than had ever been filed before. We were looking at over 3000 bills. But before everybody just completely panics about that number, you have to realize that many of those are just simply refiles because so many bills did go by the wayside. So we're looking at a lot of the same issues uh, that were filed at the beginning of session, plus some new ones, mainly revolving around um, this new way of life that that we're in right now uh, 
from a state agency standpoint, there's a lot of things that have had to be adjusted, a lot of things that have changed. Um, healthcare is obviously a massive focus for the legislature this year. So there are some new uh, there are some new issues that are out there, but most of them revolve around you know making sure that state government can adapt to weird times like this, and then also addressing the the health changes that are uh, a reality now and that people are having to adjust to across the state. Um, just quickly on the budget, you know, that's that's the only thing that the legislature is constitutionally required to do. Um, last year with the craziness, they came in, they, they went home for two months and basically just decided, hey, we're going to pass a budget and we're going to get home. Um, this year, now that they're in full time at the Capitol, that's still the requirement. They still have to pass that state budget. Um, but it's going to change a little bit just because of the year that we just had. From an economic standpoint, the state went, as well as every state in the nation, took a downturn, uh, a massive downturn because of COVID-19. We're grateful. I mean, we're, we're blessed in the state of Oklahoma that we've really made a, a very quick rebound um, from the, an economic standpoint. And so, you know, at the beginning of or during the middle of last year's session, they were looking at around a $1.6 billion shortfall that they were going to have to adjust to. Uh, they were able to be very, very conservative with the money they did appropriate and lessen that impact a little bit, which then sets them up for this year. Um, and actually today, the, the Board of Equalization, which is the body that determines exactly how much money the legislature can allocate every single year. They met today. They've uh, allocated $7.9 billion that are available to appropriate. With the budget that passed last year and what they're looking at this year, you're still looking at a shortfall, but it's not nearly as bad as what people were projecting at the end of last year. There were some doomsdayers <laughs> that were projecting, you know, two, three billion dollar shortfalls. Uh, and after the really the decade that we've had in the state of Oklahoma with budgets going up and budgets going down, there were a lot of people, including myself, going out in the world. Can you cut another two or three billion dollars just so you can get up to that level, uh, that level playing field when you're passing a budget? So things are looking a little bit better, but they still have a lot of tough decisions as they go forward this legislative session. Now, didn't a couple of years ago we pass something that deals with sort of the budget regulation, uh, sort of like smooth out these budget ups and downs, a, a fund or something along those lines. I'm trying to remember what it was now because it's been a couple of years, but wasn't there some sort of proposal that did that pass a couple of years ago? Yeah, it did. And I think what you're referring to is the rainy day fund um, that the legislature, it's, it's a constitutional fund that was set up a while back to make sure that the state government could put money aside. It's basically a savings account. You could put mo money aside to use for quote unquote rainy day. Um, well, the, the problem with how they set that up is there was only a certain percentage that could be put into that rainy day fund based on how well the economy had done that year. So if you have a certain amount of, of um, revenue available, there's only a certain percentage of that that could be put into the rainy day fund at any given time. The legislature uh, redu or it actually increased the amount that could be put in from year to year. So it did build up. And one of the reasons that last year was – uh, they were able to craft the budget they, that they did and wasn't nearly as bad as they thought it was going to be was because they used some of those rainy day funds, which was more than what they had been able to put into a budget to help stabilize from that rainy day fund. So the, the rainy day fund has built up a little bit. So there will be some of that that they are able to use this year. There will also be some areas where there will be cuts. There are just going to have to be some cuts and they're going to have the very tough job of determining where those cuts come from, but the rainy day fund can help stabilize some of that. Well, and you've uh, talked before about the the Medicaid expansion, which is certainly going to be a huge piece of the how do we pay for everything, right? We've got this whole picture of we've got this this budget, we got to pay for everything, education, all of it. And now we've got the Medicaid expansion, which is a big piece of it on top of being kind of a, a down year to some degree. Uh, which is 
always the challenge of the legislature is how do you pay for everything? Because not not everybody can have everything that they want, I guess. Right. Yeah. The, the Medicaid expansion is going to be a massive topic. Uh, this legislative session last year, the voters of Oklahoma approved the state question expanding Medicaid across the state of Oklahoma. Many other states have done that. Some haven't, but put to a vote of the people, they approved that expansion, uh, which is basically opening up the program to more people, more uh, uh expanding eligibility to more individuals in the state of Oklahoma that hadn't been able to get on Medicaid now can be enrolled in Medicaid. Now, the challenge with that is you're looking at a tremendous cost when you do that to the taxpayers of the state of Oklahoma. What I've been telling people is uh, when I've gotten questions about Medicaid expansion is a lot of people are asking the wrong question of how are we going to pay for Medicaid expansion? That's actually the wrong question to be asking because the real question should be, how are we going to pay for everything else? Because it is const- it is now in the Constitution of the state of Oklahoma that Medicaid expansion has to be paid for. So at the end of the day, they will fund Medicaid expansion. The question is, how does that affect everything else in public safety, corrections, transportation, education, all of those other things? So, uh, you know, they're, they're looking at about 200 to 300 million dollars this year just to fund Medicaid expansion. That's going to happen. Um, it, it's going to be a challenge of where if, if you take it from one area or, or if you provide it for one area, where are you going to take it from to to to, uh, to help fund that? So a lot of challenges before the legislature for sure which of course some of our big parties there are watching if there's proposals on new revenue streams that may be of concern those kinds of things obviously we'll keep right. an eye on so nothing Absolutely. yet that's a big concern i don't think but we'll keep an eye on that uh what are some of the priorities that we as the oklahoma association of realtors what are we looking at this year a couple pieces there that are of interest Yeah, well, first, we are running a bill, a request bill that we've been working on for several years now. Um, Regular listeners to this podcast and viewers of uh, social media that's been put out and involved in in the association work have uh, been working on an issue regarding wholesale, uh, real estate wholesaling. Um, It's we've been working on it for several years. Last year, we did have a measure that we had started to have that conversation with some legislators as well as the real estate commission this year we've been able to really sit down and uh narrow down some quality language regarding real estate wholesaling so we've requested a bill in the house of representatives uh the real estate commission is fully supportive of this measure as well there was a task force put together by um, last year's president amy blado with orec and we've really hashed out some language. Um, and so House Bill 1148 is the measure that we're running. Um, it's actually in committee today. Um, so by the time people are hearing this, it will have already hopefully made it out of committee. Um, and House Bill 1148 by Representative Mike Osborne and Senator Paul Racino. Um, Senator Racino has worked on several of our other things. It prohibits publicly marketing an equitable interest in a contract for the purchase of real property without holding an active real estate, Oklahoma real estate license. So if an individual is marketing uh, an equitable interest in a property, that's a licensable activity uh, in the state of Oklahoma, should this pass. Um, That is a... uh, this is a huge step um, towards making sure that you know individuals who are engaging in the largest financial transaction of their life have some accountability and some authority in that transaction. By making wholesaling a licensable activity, it puts it underneath the purview of the Oklahoma Real Estate Commission, which they can then hold buyers and sellers alike accountable in those transactions. There's um, it, it, it would treat a, uh, a wholesaling contract or a wholesaling um, agreement the same as any traditional transaction of real estate. And so it's a huge step forward. Um, you know, in the conversations we've had with legislators, it's very positive in, in what we're trying to do. Um, the Real Estate Commission, obviously, being behind it is huge as well. Um, but we're excited about it just from a protection of the public uh, standpoint. 
making sure that we see that practice, we see the wholesaling practice happen a lot towards um, vulnerable populations. Uh, we see that um, you know that practice happening in areas where. Uh, people are desperate to get rid of a property. People are, are in a situation where they're elderly um, and uh, making sure that this process is a licensable activity will give some authority and some accountability to that transaction where right now there is none. One more thing I would say on this um, is that we looked over the last year at what other states have done. Um, there have been multiple other states that have taken a bunch of different approaches on wholesaling or, or regulating wholesaling in, in some type or fashion. Some states like Illinois, uh, they prohibit the, 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 pro, the, the process completely. They, uh, they say you cannot under any circumstances um, uh, engage in wholesale activity uh, in any circumstance. Then you have other states like Texas or Arkansas that that take a little bit more of the approach that we have in making sure that uh, if it is going to, if an individual is going to engage in real estate wholesaling activities, then they just have to be licensed. So we really feel like we, we've hit a middle of the road um, of on this issue uh, that will enable the real estate commission to adapt later on through administrative rules um, and but but at the same time, setting up those accountability measures. So I think we've really hit the middle of the road with this issue. Yeah. And I was going to say, just in case someone out there does not know what wholesaling is, uh, give us a, a brief, simplified rundown of what it is. Well, there is no brief, simplified rundown. <laughs> However, I, I, I will try. Uh, practice of real estate wholesaling is when an individual enters into a contract to purchase real estate and immediately then tries to resell for profit their interest in uh, that real estate contract to a different purchaser or, uh, uh, or a, a, a different buyer prior to the closing table. So uh, an individual will go and say, you, you have a home for sale for $100,000 or a piece of property for sale for $100,000. When I enter into the contract, if I'm the wholesaler, I'm that middleman, um, I enter into the, the contract with you, I will then turn around and try to sell that contract for profit, never having uh, any, uh, never, never seeking to close on that transaction with you because I'm seeking to sell that contract somewhere else. So what you see oftentimes is you as the seller of that property, you're left hanging uh, when I determine that I can't make a profit on that contract. Therefore, I just back out of the contract that I made with you. And so uh, that's where the protection of the public comes in, making sure that Listen, this is a big financial transaction. This is this. We need to make sure that people are, are accountable, that there's some authority over those kinds of transactions, just like there are in traditional real estate transaction. So you need to have a real estate license if you do that. Um, that this wholesaling is often indistinguishable from activities an Oklahoma real estate licensee engages in right now when, when marketing a property for a seller. But right now, uh, the wholesaler is not required to hold any kind of license. I think this is think, adding a little bit of accountability to that. I think that's. I think this is great. I mean, look, <clears throat> we're talking about people that, like I said, it's indistinguishable to a large extent from what real estate licensees do and making sure that they are doing just the basic things that everyone has to do, making sure that contracts are properly in writing and submitted correctly, making sure that all parties are treated honestly. You know, I mean, these are like basic things just to protect the, the public. And I think that minimal requirements uh, to have that license, have some education so that people aren't getting taken advantage of and doing things legally and correctly seems reasonable to me. So, uh, Josh, what else are we looking at? You know, one of the issues that, that we've actually been working on early in session that started to pop up at the end of last year and is another old issue that we've dealt with for many, many years uh, as realtors um, and just goes to point, it goes to show 
that um, when you are working in government affairs, you have to be able to work with everybody and you have to be able to work towards a common goal of what you are working for. But you're also working with a bunch of different groups uh, with varying viewpoints. And that's the issue of property registries. You know, this is an issue that really came to a head in Oklahoma in 2014 uh, when a bill that uh, House Bill 2620 back in 2014, the OAR was pushing to make sure that municipalities could not um, put together registries of individuals for the purpose of gaining contact information. So there was a there was that bill run. It was passed through the legislature, signed by then Governor Mary Fallon. Um, that made sure that registries couldn't be made, um, that a, uh, a fee could not be uh, assessed on collecting information. So there was it was a it was a large property, private property rights issue that realtors were very successful in. Well, since that time, uh, the Oklahoma Municipal League has been working to try to loosen some of those requirements because they are coming at it from the view of they have to be able to deal with uh dilapidated properties within their municipalities and they have a, a, a tough time of figuring out who will actually own a property who's responsible for the property who do we contact if we need to you know uh, use some abatement procedures um, you know they they have processes in place to make sure that their their cities are and, and their municipalities are are uh, safe for the public, you know, there's there's a bunch of things that they have to go through. So they've been working really in several different forms to try to loosen up some of the work that we've done. Um, over the last year, we've really began the conversation with them uh, to say, OK, municipalities have an issue you're trying to do uh, to, that you're trying to assess and, and work on. Realtors are passionate about private property rights, making sure that that inf the, that information that property owners give is is secure is confidential. And so um, we've been working with them on Senate Bill 277 and Senator John Michael Montgomery from Lawton is running that in the Senate right now. It passed out of committee last week that basically says that for the purposes of emergency contacts, making sure that municipalities know who owns a property and how to get a hold of either the property owner or the property manager, that they can retain that information for that purpose and that purpose alone. They cannot, uh, they cannot charge a fee for collecting that information from any of the property owners. And also that all information that they do obtain from those property owners is completely confidential, cannot be shared with anybody, and is not even subject to the Oklahoma Open Records Act, meaning that nobody anywhere under any circumstances can get that information. It's only to be used for emergency contact purposes. Say there's a house on fire or there's a, uh, you know, a structure that is obviously a danger or a piece of property that's obviously a danger to the public health and safety. They need to have some ability uh, to know who to contact. But we we um, advocated very strongly for and were successful in making sure that they were um, that, that they made that all of that com information confidential with no exceptions whatsoever. So that's a big win for private property rights in the state of Oklahoma, but it's also an area we were able to come to the middle and kind of work with the Oklahoma Municipal League. Um, you know, OML and OAR, we've bumped heads, just quite frankly, we've bumped heads on several issues over the years. And so it's been really good to, to see some positive um uh, team building, if you will, um, on, on this issue to to be able to come to the middle and say, hey, we've got our issues. You've got our your issues. How can we find some middle ground? And so far, like I mentioned, it passed through committee last week uh, with a unanimous vote. Um, we're we're extremely um, excited to see where it goes this legislative session. I love the the kumbaya here, let's all get together and, and figure out where we can, where we can work together. I mean, it does. Why, it's not, why can't more things be that way? I love it. I think it's just perfect that we can work through the issues. You know, they say, here's what we want to do. We know you guys will have a problem with this. So how can we fix it ahead of time before we then get into a battle and we're trying to kill their bill and uh, whatever, right? We, we fix it ahead of time and we can all go in holding hands together saying, look, this is, this is a good bill. Let's, let's make this happen. So makes everybody's life easier. So I just. Right. A much more efficient use of time and resources. 
Yeah, I mean, it's it's communication and far too often in life, but particularly in politics, it seems like we have just different sides going at it without ever stopping and pausing to to communicate with one another. So, um, you know, fully recognizing we've had that conversation with OML saying, here's our line in the sand that we can't cross. We know this is your line in the sand that you can't cross. How can we get it? closer to those lines and still be okay with, um, working with one another. I, that's just, that's, that's good government. Absolutely. It's just good life. It's just good. It's just good. <laughs> it's good stuff. Love it. it does, you don't get to tell the good news very often, right? Like it's always the problems that we're solving or trying to solve and the heads that we're bumping up against. So it's a uh, good to have a, cooperation story every once in a while. So glad to hear mm-hmm. that. So as we uh, then move forward, we've got a few more months of sessions still left. We're just at the very beginning. What sort of are you expecting to see um, that's maybe just interesting to leave people with as we're closing out here, something to be looking at over the next few months? You know, thankfully, I think in the next few months, as far as issues that we are actively engaged with and, and work on private property rights, uh, removing barriers to home ownership, I think it'll be a fairly, and this is major knock on wood, I think it'll be a fairly light year um, for those issues just because the legislature is focused, as they always are on the budget, but even more so with the health care piece tied in this year. There's a lot going on there. There's a lot of bickering back and forth of the best way to do things on the healthcare space. Um, you know, you still have the challenges with COVID-19. I think we're going to continue to have to be vigilant on um, especially landlord tenant issues. Um, there's there's a few issues moving through the legislature that we're just kind of keeping an eye on, not really sure, and really beginning those conversations with legislators to see where they're going with a few of these things. We knew there were going to be um, so, some issues that popped up out of the pandemic, just with eviction moratoriums, uh, trying to figure out you know rental assistance from the federal level. There, there's going to be some landlord landlord tenant issues that the legislature is going to deal with. Not all of that's kind of come to a head yet. So we're not really sure where it's going, but it's something that we'll continue to watch. But I think for the most part, um, you know, people are, uh, legislators are uh, focused on some of those headliner issues this year. Um, So we'll continue to be vigilant as we go forward. But, um, you know, I I think for the most part, uh, if we can continue to work on some of those low lying issues, it's going to be a very successful 2021 legislative session. And one last thing, um, this is sort of maybe a little bit outside of the Oklahoma legislature, but uh, we talked on a podcast a, a few weeks ago, I think, about um, some federal money coming in for pandemic assistance for uh, rental assistance. Um, do, do we have any updates on that? Kind of what's going on there? Because we know that the state had to apply for it. And maybe there's some money was allocated to the state. But do we have any idea what's going on in that realm? Yeah. So the state did apply for the rental assistance that was under the $60 billion package don't quote me on that number. It's it's roughly about sixty billion um, that was available for rental assistance for landlords uh, in all fifty states through the last stimulus package that was that was passed in D.C. Uh, so the state applied for OAR sent a letter of support to the governor asking uh, for them to apply for that. They did that. Um, and the state has received approximately two hundred and ten million dollars for landlord rental assistance uh, in the state of Oklahoma. That's as far as we know. <laughs> um, the state the state has the money. We do know that. Um, it's, you know, anytime, I, I kind of liken it to when we started this whole journey back in March and April and PUA came out, pandemic unemployment assistance. It was such a new thing. Uh, you know, independent contractors were able to apply for this PUA. Um, the state had to administer it, but didn't have any of the systems set up to do that. Um, I think that's kind of the same situation we're in here, where the state is re- going to receive the money from the Treasury. It's now up to the state to determine how to allocate that money out. 
Um, and so here in the next days and weeks, I think we're going to hear more information on how exactly that's going to happen through what programs or organizations or whatever that's going to look like, how that's going to be distributed to um, to renters across the state of Oklahoma. So we do have the money. Um, it's just how, how is it going to go out now? I'm sure there are a lot of people eagerly awaiting that decision. Yes. yes. Well, we'll keep an eye on it and we'll certainly be getting that information out as soon as we know more about it. We'll get that out to all of our listeners and members so that if that's something that, you know, investors that they work with or they themselves who happen to be landlords need to take advantage of that, then we'll try to have that information available as soon as we know, you'll know. So, Josh, I know you got to get down to the Capitol despite the fact that the roads are treacherous and there's more weather coming the show must go on and the legislature is meeting and I know you got work to do down there. So thank you so much for giving us a little bit of time today. I know we'll have you back over the coming months, a handful of times so that we can give you updates on everything that's going on down at the Oklahoma legislature. Absolutely. Always a pleasure, guys. Well, Nabil, I think it's time to close this one out. So it's another episode of Talking Real in the books through rain, sleet, snow, doesn't matter. We're bringing you Talking Real every Tuesday. That's right. That's right. And if you haven't done so yet, hit that subscribe button so you know when the next episode is out and share this podcast with a fellow real estate enthusiast and spread the love of Talking Real. Absolutely. So until next time, we'll see you next Tuesday on Talking Real.